You remember Michael Avenatti, the guy who used to represent Stormy Daniels. They were frolicking around together. We were all wondering what was going on there. Turns out he broke the law. He's in prison. Going to be there for a little bit longer. But he called in on NBC News show and explained what he thought about the Stormy Cohen brag trial that is scheduled to start on the 15th. And it's a surprising interview because Avenatti is no fan of Donald Trump, but he laced into the brag prosecution and Cohen's credibility and Stormy's credibility. And even Trump is saying, you know, Avenatti sounded pretty good these days. He posted this on True Social and Avenatti posted this, I guess from prison. He said, we can't be hypocrites when it comes to the First Amendment, you know. It's outrageous that Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels can do countless TV interviews. They can post on social media. They can make money on bogus documentaries all by talking crap about Trump. But he's gagged and he's threatened with jail if he responds. Trump said, hey, thank you, Michael Avenatti. A good point, dude, for revealing the truth about two sleaze bags who have with their lies and misrepresentations cost our country. And so Michael Avenatti is going to lace into Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels and we'll listen to him in a minute. But Trump also posted this and this was a curious one from Trump. We've talked about this before and seen this before but on truth he says hey look what I just found. Will the fake news report it? Here's the official statement from Stormy Daniels January 30th 2018. She officially released this and she walked it back but here's what she says. To whom it may concern. Over the past few weeks, I've been asked countless times to comment on reports of an alleged sexual relationship I had with Donald Trump many, many, many years ago. The fact of the matter is that each party to this alleged affair denied its existence in 2006, 2011, 2016, 2017, and now again in 2018. I am not denying this affair because I was paid, quote, hush money, as has been reported in the overseas owned tabloids. I am denying this affair because it never happened. I will have no further comment on this matter. Please feel free to check me out on Instagram at the Stormy Daniels. Signed, thank you, Stormy Daniels signature. So now she has said that's not really accurate. That's not true. All of this stuff. Okay, you can be the judge of that because here's even the AP fact checking this. They said, here's a claim. There's a newly classified document shows that Stormy admitted that she never had an affair with Trump. This article was just updated, published March 24th, like almost a year ago to the day. So here's the missing context. The signed statement with the denial was in fact publicly released, but it was just missing context. Not long after she released that, Daniels recanted the statement and said that an affair had occurred, okay? Signs it never occurred, leave me alone. I've said this many times. She said her denials were due to non-disclosure agreements that she signed. She signed the statement because the parties involved made it sound like I had no choice, okay? So that's her. She is just, I guess, the same as Michael Cohen, right? Admits that there was no affair at all. But here is Avenatti, right? He calls in, he's stuck in prison. And so let's see where we're at. You assess the strength of the prosecution's case. Well, I think what I'm about to say is going to surprise a lot of people. And that is that, you know, I think this is the wrong case at the wrong time. Okay. I, I think that the case is in many ways stale at this juncture. You're talking about conduct that occurred some eight years ago. I think the fact that it's occurring in state court in New York is a mistake. And I think that when you are going to to potentially deprive tens of millions of Americans of their choice for the presidency of the United States, whether we agree with those folks or not, or regardless of what we may think of Donald Trump, I think it's a mistake to do it based on a case of this nature. I was hoping, frankly, that there would have been less hand-wringing, less bedwetting, and that the January 6th case would have been filed in a more timely manner. There's no excuse or reason as to why that case could not have been brought in 2020 and it should have been brought in 2021. Yeah, many others were. And remember, the Proud Boys have already been convicted and sentenced. Those were five co-defendants, right? Much broader case. And there was actual, you know, communications and stuff there that they were digging into, like lots of moving parts with the whole organization. Trump, you know, they hit him with five charges and they're all related to his speech, talking to Pence, talking to the governors, talking to the, you know, state officials, alternate electors, all those things. It's not even a complex case, but they delayed it for a reason, to time them all up. And then they just botched it because they're not really competent. And had it been brought in 2021, we would not find ourselves in the situation that we're in right now. I know a lot of people have been critical of the United States Supreme Court and as well as the second, not the second, but the D.C. Circuit. You know, I think those complaints are frankly misplaced. And Michael, have you been in touch with D.A. Bragg's office and what specifically in evidence or logic do you think is wrong with this case? Well, I'm going to decline to answer as to whether I've been in touch with, you know, either the defense 
or the DA's office. But, Interesting. But let me say this in response to the second part of your question. You know, I think the case has a lot of problems. Now, that does not, I don't mean to suggest that that means that Trump will not be convicted because I think he York. will be convicted. It's hmm. New York. Because number one, he's a criminal defendant and in our society, I don't believe the criminal defendants generally get a fair shake. In fact, I think that the percentage of convictions demonstrates that the deck is stacked decidedly against all criminal defendants. Number two, I don't That's think true. that he can get a fair trial in New York. And to the people who claim that, in fact, he can get a fair trial in New York with a New York jury, I would ask them if they were to go to sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow and find out that the case had been moved to Mississippi or Alabama, would they still think that the trial was going to be fair? And I think if they were being honest, they would answer no. So I don't think he can get a fair trial in New York. But separate apart from that, I think the case does have problems. I mean, number one, I don't know who the narrator witnesses are going to be in the case. And by that, I mean that every case needs to have one or two primary it's gotta witnesses be Cohen. who tell the story. It's got to be Cohen and Stormy. From my perspective, and Stormy. Uh, I surmise that the DA is going to use potentially Michael Cohen or Stormy Daniels gotta for that be. purpose. And I think that has the potential to be a disaster. More likely Michael. And you know, I've never been a fan of Michael for various reasons. You know, he's a serial liar. He's shown himself to be incapable of telling the truth. You know, his False legal statements. acumen leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, let's just say that if, you know, if Learned Hand or Clarence Darrow had a love child, it certainly wouldn't be someone like Michael Cohen. Trump claims that he just paid retainer money, and now it's being prosecuted as Those basically the financial that he fraud, wrote. lying about the expense. You have a lot of experience in this case. Is Donald Trump lying when he says it was all going to just be a retainer? I don't believe that. I've never believed it. And if you go back and look at the interviews, in fact, that you and I conducted back in 2018, I've always scoffed at that and thought it was ridiculous. But my point is one just of trial dynamics. Who's going to tell the story? And the problem is, is that if the prosecution relies predominantly on Michael Cohen and, you know, documents don't admit themselves into evidence. You know, I see various legal commentators talk about, well, this is a document case. Well, that may be true to a certain degree, but you've still got to have somebody on the stand that tells the story story. And to say that Michael Cohen is a problem witness would be an understatement. And look, here's the other issue. He literally lied again in court in New York. They just sentenced Weisselberg to, I think, five months again for apparently committing perjury in the Tish James trial. That's Trump's former CFO. Michael Cohen either lied in Letitia James's prosecution as her star witness, literally in Angeron's court, or lied when he was taking his plea deal to a federal judge. So he has committed perjury again, and they're just overlooking the whole thing. That has to be brought up because there was a federal order about this, right? It goes to his credibility. It goes to his character for truthfulness. So he's a disaster, you know, to have as the primary witness. Now they might have someone else, but the Cohen is the key transactor, right? He's the person who's going to be able to tell us about the nature of the relationship. You know, Alina Abba is not going to be trying this case for hey, Donald Trump. Watch it. Now, I don't know how he got him, but he got real lawyers in this Hey, case. and these lawyers know their way around a courtroom. Hey, and I think they're going to have watch an it, absolute bucko. field day with Michael Cohen on the stand. Well, let me ask you so this, then, Michael, because you said some people might be surprised that you, Michael Avenatti, speaking to us today, see all the weakness in this case. I do want to remind you that back when you were involved, you said Trump should have liability. You said federal prosecutors in New York should present this material to a grand jury for potential indictment of Trump when he was president. So how can you explain going from that then to what you're saying tonight, that you actually think this is a troubled case? Well, I can explain it this way, Ari. You're absolutely right. I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times in 2018 in October, which predated the criminal investigation into me by about 10 days, coincidentally enough, and I don't believe in coincidences. I wrote that op-ed and I advocated for the indictment of then sitting President Donald Trump, and I stand by that 100%. Which is also I advocated dumb. for SDNY federal prosecutors that. in the Southern District of New York to bring campaign finance charges. And by the way, no cogent explanation has ever been provided by anybody as to who made that decision and why they didn't bring those charges either while he was president or immediately thereafter. And I think that's a question that people need to ask. The problem that I have with this case... He's right about that. It is hard to find out why there was no prosecution. There was a guy, his name is escaping me right now, but there was another Southern District of New York attorney who was there and he was there very temporarily. Bill Barr asked him to resign. He didn't resign. Then Trump basically fired him and then he left. And that was kind of the end of it. So it's been a weird case, I think probably because it relies on Michael Cohen. And Michael Cohen has such a bad record that the SDNY couldn't do anything. Like, what are they going to do with this case? Even if it's a campaign finance violation, they got to tie it back to Cohen, right? It's basically a campaign 
campaign finance violation type of a crime. It's like a spreadsheet crime. It is a checkbook problem. You misappropriated something. And so they're, it's falsifying a business record. So SDNY said it wasn't there. Their star witness would have had to have been the same guy, Cohen. If now, I have a number of problems. First of all, cases are not like fine red wine, Ari. They don't get better with age. And this case hasn't gotten better with age. Number two, I don't believe this case belongs in state court. And I think it rests on a legally tenuous theory, namely that the crime that was attempted to be covered up was a federal election crime. I think that could be a problem potentially on appeal for the state. And number three, let me slow you down and then you'll go to number three. But you're just to be clear saying that with your knowledge of all of this, if the DA is trying to make this stick as a felony, as a serious matter based on federal rather than state crime, you think that could be a hole in the whole theory of this case? I do. And I think it's going to be tested on appeal when Trump is convicted. And again, I think he will be convicted. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to hold up. I believe if you're going to bring a case against a sitting president or a former president who tens of millions of people support, especially in today's day and age with how divided we are, I think it needs to be a rock solid, lock tight, nearly perfect prosecuted case. Because otherwise you run a huge risk as to what it's going to mean for the country. And I don't believe this case right now is the case. Yeah, so here is the background on the prosecutor. This guy's name is Jeffrey Berman. This guy, former U.S. attorney. And this is an article from 2018, 2019, July 18. Federal prosecutors signaled in court documents on Thursday that it was unlikely they would file additional charges. This is Southern District of New York. So in a document, the prosecutor said they had effectively concluded their inquiry, which centered on payments from 2016. So we don't know exactly what that was. You know, what was the basis for that? So it is strange, but their case obviously wasn't any good. And that's the problem that I have. But I stand behind everything I said in 2018, everything I wrote in that op-ed. And I remain very concerned that no one has gotten to the bottom of what the hell exactly happened with SDNY in 2018. Was that decision made by Jeffrey Berman? Was that decision made by William Barr? Who made that decision and why was it made to turn a blind eye to Donald Trump's yeah. conduct? Well, Michael, you mentioned your history. You also wrote that there are facts and evidence, text, emails, etc., in the Hush Money case that have yet to see the light of day that will be, quote, very damaging to the prosecution. Uh-oh. Have those since seen the light of day? What are you Stormy and Cohen podcasting well, texts? Are they scheduling another interview? You know what I mean? I'm going to be careful about what's been disclosed and who it's been disclosed to. I don't know ultimately if they will see the light of day during the trial. But, you know, Ari, over the course of the representation, my representation of Miss Daniels, I came to learn a number of things, unfortunately, from her that turned out to be completely untrue. And a lot of that is what led me to wow. terminate my representation of her in February of 2019. One of the big things that I learned, unfortunately, is that what I had been sold by Miss Daniels relating to how this payment had came about and what I had subsequently advocated on television and others in reliance on what she had told me turned out to be completely false. Wow. Uh, it had been represented to me that she had not attempted to extort Donald Trump and the campaign in the waning days of 2016, that they had come to her. And I believed her when she told me that repeatedly. Trump came to Unfortunately, her. Unfortunately, in early 2019, I came to learn that that was not true. Does it matter to the legal case who initiated it? She went to Trump, right? She says, I'm going public unless you give me money. Not Trump going to her to clean up loose ends. So he's calling Stormy a liar. She lied to me. I dropped her as a client. If, as you said earlier tonight, Donald Trump still lied about it and potentially lied to the government about it. I don't think from a legal perspective it matters, but okay. I think very well from an optics standpoint it could matter. And again, I believe he'll be convicted in the case, but I don't think it's going to move the needle to the degree that some people believe that it will. I think a lot of this is already baked into the analysis relating, for instance, to the campaign. I mean, I've seen the polls and I've seen the pundits talk about that if he's criminally convicted, it's going to be meaningful as it relates to the presidential election. I don't think that's going to be true if he's convicted in this particular right. case. Let me ask you this. And I agree with that. And we made that point that, you know, they keep saying, well, the reason we have to prosecute Trump, the reason why we're shattering 234 years of American history in order to do this is because we've never had a president who's acted so egregiously like this. And you say, wait a minute, what? No president has ever, you know, paid off someone before, you know, or engaged in a contract to settle 
settle a claim or something like this? Like, give me a break. We have Bill Clinton. Hello. And you say, well, they just didn't get caught, right? And so I guess there's justification that Trump should be prosecuted because he got caught because it's a political prosecution. And by the way, like this case is from 2016, 17 payments. So why did they bring it a long time ago? Well, because it was rejected by Cyrus Vance, wasn't actually brought back. Even Alvin Bragg rejected it until Matthew Colangelo came over from the DOJ and from Biden. And then this whole case got resurrected again. So there's you know, a lot of illegitimacy with this from the very beginning. Michael, you've thrown some cold water on what some people thought was a strong case here. And you've also given your analysis of what may happen and we'll all be watching. At the same time, you have implied that your treatment by the then Barr and Trump Justice Department was harsher than other people may have been dealt with if they weren't in your position. You had become for a time a very prominent foe of then President Trump. Do you say tonight that there is evidence that you were treated differently? And if so, does that mean anything for what a second term Trump DOJ might look like? Are you afraid elected? he's going to indict you harder this I, I time? I don't believe there's any question that I was treated differently. And I believe that if anyone is asked that honestly and looks at what happened here, and if they're honest in their answer, I believe that they would answer the same way that I have. I was indicted in three separate cases within 54 days. The government proceeded to stack these sentences on top of one another. Look at this one. Paraplegic client settlement money stolen. Avenatti charged trying to extort Nike, 25 million. Avenatti charged stealing 300 grand from Stormy Daniels. I was not treated fairly and I was treated um, differently. And I firmly believe and will go to my grave believing that one of the reasons, the reason I was treated in this fashion was because I was the biggest enemy of Donald Trump in 2018. There's no question about that. And I was also his most dangerous enemy. And finally, what do you say to people listening tonight who think, well, even if that's the case and there was differential treatment, you still were caught and at times expressed, you know, contrition for crimes and crimes related to dishonesty. Why should people take your word on any of this tonight? Well, because I think I demonstrated over a significant period of time and over a couple decades of legal work that I've done a lot of good, that a lot of what I've said has checked out, that I generally have not trafficked in nonsense. There's no question, Ari, that I made mistakes. There's no question that I exercised poor judgment at times, but no question that I exercised poor judgment at times. But I think people need to ask yourself or themselves, are you really going to define somebody by the worst thing they did in their life, or are you going to look at the totality of the body of their work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was getting curious to see if he was going to say something like, I didn't do what I did, you know, because the judge might have a problem with that if he's sitting in custody. Certainly say, oh, you didn't. That's weird, because did you take a plea deal for any of this stuff? Oh, that's curious, because you said you did do the thing. So anyways, very curious interview from Avenatti, basically saying that Stormy is not credible, confirming this story that there is a belief that Trump went to her to clean this thing up, but sounds like maybe she went to him to try to extort him out of money and he just paid to make it the whole thing go away given the fact that he just got elected to be the president don't need to deal with any of this stuff so trump responded to this lawfare everywhere in new york and elsewhere said the white house thugs should not be allowed to have these dangerous and unfair biden trials during my campaign for president all of them civil and criminal could have been brought more than three years ago it's an illegal attack on political opponent it's communism at its worst and election interference at its best no such thing has ever happened in our country before on Monday, I will be forced to sit gagged before a highly conflicted and corrupt Judge Mercon, whose hatred for me has no bounds. All of these New York and D.C. quote judges and prosecutors have the same mindset. Nobody but this Soro prosecutor, Alvin Bragg, wanted to take this ridiculous case. All legal scholars say it was a sham. Biden's DOJ is running the case. Just think of it. These animals want to put the former president of the United States, who got more votes than any sitting president, and the party's Republican candidate in jail for doing absolutely absolutely nothing wrong. It is a rush to the finish. So unfair. And it's true. So, you know, when they say that Trump is you know, egregious and to finish my earlier point that he is stepping outside, this is breaking the norm. You know, this is not like the others, right? This case is New York, Manhattan's prosecutor's office. They have such a bad record. They were in there trying to get better deals for Epstein. All right. They were in there trying to suppress evidence against Weinstein, against victims. Like they were supporting Weinstein. So don't come out and say that they're all, you know, high and mighty on contracts to suppress stories in New York. It's New York. So they're obviously singling him out, targeting him, and they have some of the worst people to make their case. They've got Michael Cohen, already convicted of felonies, Stormy Daniels, who already put out a statement saying none of this ever happened, and Avenatti, who is in prison, saying that they're both unreliable and, you know, idiots. So the trial is seemingly going on Monday, my friend. So we're going to be here covering it. Hopefully you join us as we do. Thank you so much for subscribing.
subscribing wherever it is you're watching this. Thanks for liking this video, for sharing some content with a friend or family member who may not have seen it before so that they can come over here and join us as we dig into this. We've got some pretty good plans to cover the trial, and I think there's going to be a lot to unpack together. So thank you also for checking out watchingthewatchers.locals.com, which is our members-only community where we do live streams in the morning and on Saturdays. We already did a live stream here today, and we had a great time doing it. We have an amazing community. We talk about other things that we can't get to here. We'd love to see you come and join us at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Have some fun, and it's a great way to support our work here as well. So thanks for seeing us over there and for joining us back here on the next one. Thank you.